following the amazing critical and financial smash success of Daniel Craig's first James Bond film, Casino Royale, the producers of the franchise decided to strike while the iron was hot by quickly greenlighting a follow-up. Now, in the days leading up to Casino Royale's release, they were actually teeing up the fact that the next Daniel Craig James Bond movie, which was to be called Quantum of Solace, from a short story in the Free Your Eyes Only collection, was actually going to be out 18 months later. This would have been probably the shortest turnaround for a James Bond movie since the early days of Sean Connery. But in the end, cooler heads prevailed because I think it's pretty hard to launch a $200 million movie in 18 months, and they ended up waiting a more reasonable two years. However, the production of Quantum of Solace was plagued from start to finish, not the least bit by the Writers Guild strike, which derailed most TV shows in that era and seriously hampered the film, with apparently Daniel Craig and director Mark Forster having to come in to rewrite some of the sections themselves during the screenwriters' strike as Neil Purvis, Robert Wade, and co-writer Paul Haggis couldn't write due to union rules. Now, Quantum of Solace is a James Bond movie that's often heavily criticized. Most people consider it a vastly inferior sequel to Casino Royale, and I'm inclined to agree. I remember going to see this movie at a critic screening, which in fact would have been the first critic screening I ever attended for a James Bond film, and being let down. I think my expectations were so high after Casino Royale, I expected another all-out masterpiece, but what I got was not at all what I was expecting. First of all, it was a movie that was only 105 minutes long, which seemed really strange for a James Bond movie. When is a James Bond movie not at least over two hours? Watching the movie, it felt really like a clone of The Bourne Identity, or rather one of the Paul Haggis sequels. It was so evocative of the Bourne franchise that it felt like straight up plagiarism. And I felt like at times I wasn't watching a James Bond movie, I was watching a Bourne film. It had non-stop action, too much action. There was no flavor to the film, which I think is where Quantum of Solace really goes wrong. Instead, it's just a hectic jumble of action scenes, some of which I must admit are quite impressive. And the movie holds up a little bit better than I think people thought when it originally came out, but probably is the second worst of the Daniel Craig series. Now, the premise of Quantum of Solace is kind of interesting. This was going to be the first time in the James Bond franchise where we would get a direct sequel to the predecessor. And in fact, Quantum of Solace picks up right where Casino Royale left off with Mr. White in James Bond's trunk of his Aston Martin DB5 evading pursuers. He's wearing the same suit he was wearing at the end of Casino Royale. It's picking up right where it left off and it starts off in the middle of this insane car chase, which I must admit is impressive, but also impossible to decipher. I think part Part of the problem with this movie is that the second unit director, Dan Bradley, who was renowned for doing the James Bond films, really seemed to almost be the director of the film and his style of filming absolutely dominated the movie, much more so than Mark Forster's. In fact, it would take quite a while for the actual plot and James Bondish elements of the film to actually fall into place, with it taking a long time for us to even be introduced to the villain and the main James Bond girl, who in fact is not really a Bond girl at all in my opinion. So, in this movie, James Bond is on the trail of Quantum, the shadowy group that betrayed Vesper Lynn and set James Bond up. He finds Mr. White, who quickly escapes, and leads him to Dominic Green. Now, Dominic Green is a leading member of Quantum, posing as a businessman working in reforestation, a charity funding for environmental science. What he wants in this film is to create a coup d'etat by selling water back to the Bolivian government at rapidly inflating prices after creating an artificial drought. Basically, it's the premise of Chinatown, but in a James Bond move. Along the way, James Bond meets up with the kinda sorta Bond girl in the film, Camila Montes, played by Olga Kurilenko. Now, this is a bit of a strange piece of casting because Ora Kurilenko is, of course, Ukrainian, and she's playing Bolivian in the film, kind of in brownface, which I think wouldn't go over too well nowadays, but people didn't really have a problem with, I guess, 12 years ago. And Olga Kurilenko, I have to say, is actually a really good actress, and I think does a good job in the film. Like Bond, she's damaged, wounded, by the fact that Dominic Green, her lover, betrayed her and her family and had most of them killed with her sporting a back scar that speaks to the tragedy in her life. And in fact, there's a really, really effective sequence at the end where Heather, with her family having died in a fire, she's kind of paralyzed in this inferno that she winds up in with James Bond. And James Bond, in kind of a really gallant 
move really comforts her and saves her life, and I think is one of the most heroic moments for Daniel Craig in any James Bond movie up to this point. Now the movie does pick up on a lot of threads from Casino Royale. Rene Mathis at the end of Casino Royale is captured because everybody thinks that he's betrayed James Bond, and in fact he turns out to be innocent, and in this movie is pressed back into service opposite Bond and dies a pretty quick death, which I think makes Bond feel kind of sad. And in fact James Bond inflicts a lot of collateral damage in this movie, with the most notorious being Gemma Arderton as MI6 agent Strawberry Fields, who is quickly seduced by Bond in a very stylish scene, but ends up being killed in a moment that I think is supposed to be a complete reference to Goldfinger with her dipped head to toe in oil. It's not quite as visually striking as the golden girl in Goldfinger, but it is kind of a nice moment. And James Bond indeed seems grieved by the fact that she dies, but also extremely cold-blooded, as Daniel Craig is throughout most of these movies. You see, in this, James Bond is on a path of vengeance with little time for any kind of emotion at all. And in fact, the original screenplay of the film was supposed to be even darker, with him discovering a child left behind by Vesper Lynn that he was going to abandon in the end. But of course, Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson did force the writers to tone things down a little bit because James Bond ultimately is a heroic and just couldn't abandon the child at the end of the film. One of the most notorious creative decisions in this movie was to hire Mark Forster, a German director to direct, who was the first Bond director that was chosen from outside of the British Commonwealth. Forster was a very accomplished director at this time, having directed Halle Berry to an Oscar win in Monster's Ball, in addition to Finding Neverland, Stranger Than Fiction, and The Kite Runner, and indeed would go on to direct a movie that became a huge, huge kind of what-the-fuck episode for us, the World War Z. But at the time, you know, he was an A-list director, and I think was considered a very classy choice for Quantum of Solace, but it didn't quite work out. Mark Forster, as solid a director as he is, doesn't really seem like an action guy, and in fact, he doesn't put much of a stamp on the action scenes, which, as I mentioned, are really chaotic, and in fact, kind of seem ripped off from the Bourne franchise. If ever a James Bond movie was guilty of copying other action films, this was definitely the case with Quantum of Solace, because if the Bourne movies didn't exist, I feel like Quantum of Solace would have no style at all. Everybody involved clearly watched those movies and wanted to do as much of a James Bond epoxy of them as they could. Fair enough, the Bourne series itself is heavily inspired by the James Bond series, but the way that he was fighting in those movies really does seem to get cloned here, and it's a bit of a disappointment because I think that Casino Royale struck a really nice balance between the new style of action scenes and an older school James Bond vibe. My biggest problem with the movie when I went to go see it is that it simply didn't feel like a James Bond movie. There was no glamour. There was no sex. Guten Tag. Uh, my family and I are looking for sex. Violent. There was a lot of action, but there was probably too much action. I think James Bond movies are at their best when they have a couple of really big set pieces, but then have kind of a compelling plot, a larger than life villain, a Bond girl, and this movie doesn't really have any of them. Olga Kurylenko is lovely, but her character is definitely not a Bond girl. The fact that there's no traditional Bond girl in the movie does make sense, of course, because Vesper Lynn died in the previous installment and James Bond is still heartbroken and betrayed, so it wouldn't really make sense for him to have another de facto love interest, although Although, then again, he does jump into bed pretty quickly with Strawberry Fields, so I don't know, it seems like they kind of lost the plot here a little bit. I remember seeing this movie and being blown away by the action. Too blown away. In fact, by the time the fourth major action scene in the movie began, less than 30 minutes into the film, I started to become numb to it, and the action scenes, which are kind of cool, are very, very hard to follow in this movie and totally lose their impact. They're just a jumble of shots that don't really make any sense. If Forrester does have a strength, I'd say that his visuals are pretty interesting. The production design of Dominic Green's Quantum Headquarters and the cinematography by Roberto Schaefer, and there's some really good style in the climax of the film. But this is too little too late, I think. There's some really dynamic shots, but the movie itself is kind of boring. Plotline just isn't any good. And chief among the problems is the villain. I think that Mathieu Amaric is a great actor. Everybody says he looks a lot like Roman Polanski, and I'm inclined to agree, although his eyes are crazier. But he's just it's not very memorable as the villain, although he does get a blood-curdling death scene where James Bond leaves him alone in the desert without any water, just some oil so that he could die slowly. It's pretty grim. They found Green dead in the middle of the Bolivian desert of all places. They found motor oil in his stomach. But there's never a second in the movie where I think he's a credible threat to James Bond. And I remember his second in command, Elvis, being terrible. He had a bowl cut which is revealed to be a wig. So I don't get it. He's supposed to be kind of comic relief. I mean, you're supposed to be afraid of the henchmen. You're not supposed to laugh at them. Quanta 
The Bond villain in this movie is probably the worst we've ever gotten, so I'd give him a 5 on 10. Bond girl, as I said, she's not really a Bond girl. I love Olga Kurilenko, I think she's beautiful, and I think the character is quite intriguing, so I'd give her probably a 7 on 10, but it's just the fact is, there's no relationship. I do wish that the movie had actually not been a straight sequel to Casino Royale, and had jumped ahead at least a couple of months, you know, in order to show Bond a little bit more back in his groove to make it more of a James Bond movie. Or, if they had decided to go the really gritty route, just don't bother having a Bond girl at all. In fact, this kind of worked for the next film in the series, Skyfall. So. It feels like they were going halfway between a Bond girl and halfway between not having a Bond girl, so she was a compromise, and I don't think it really worked out. This is another one of the serious James Bond movies that doesn't really have any gadgets. Q only gets introduced in the next installment, which of course we'll get to shortly, although there's some beautiful cars. And my favorite thing about the movie is James Bond's tailoring in this film is absolutely on point, with all of his clothes being done by Tom Ford. I remember when this movie came out, I got myself a Tom Ford catalog, and I wanted to buy this really cool cardigan that he wears in the film. Of course, I I realized that the cardigan was something like two thousand dollars i ended up not buying it but i got a bit of a knockoff that i wore for a while for about two minutes i think i looked a little bit like daniel craig but you know lost all my hair so didn't get to look like him very long one of the things that's kind of interesting about quantum of solace though is that the supporting cast is really good jeffrey wright is back as felix slider who i didn't really mention that much in the casino royale episode but i always really liked him in the part and i think he's very strong in this film with him having kind of a larger role than usual although apparently his role which was actually even bigger originally was cut down due to rewrites. Another guy that comes into the film is David Harbour, who before he became famous doing Stranger Things shows up as Greg Beam, a CIA section chief for South America and one of Felix Leiter's contacts. He's kind of a cool actor to have in a James Bond movie and I found that he really kind of grounded the movie in international intrigue, but he's not in it quite enough. The movie has a kind of interesting musical score by David Arnold and in fact it would turn out to be his last James Bond score ever, although fingers crossed that he'll eventually return one day. What's kind of interesting about the film is that the use of the James Bond theme was kept to an absolute minimum here just as it was in Casino Royale. It pops up here and there but really not too much. It's a totally different approach to the score and kind of impressionistic actually. It's too bad that Arnold wasn't allowed to continue because I always thought he was one of the greatest assets of the series but they kind of seem to lose interest in his musical stylings after a while and I think that's nowhere more evident than in the fact that the theme song would be done by Jack White of the White Stripes and Alicia Keys, Another Way to Die, which is the first James Bond music duet, but also probably ranks as one of the least memorable James Bond songs ever. Jack White is many things, and I think he's great, but James Bondish? I don't think so. And I think that their use of the song doesn't really fit the movie too much, although the opening credits are kinda cool and stylized, although not very James Bond-like, I have to say. Now apparently this movie was one of the most product placement enhanced films of all time with a reported 50 million pounds being earned with Ford, Heineken, Smirnoff, Omega, Virgin Atlantic and Sony Ericsson all getting huge shoutouts in the movie. Why is this necessary? Because this also ended up being the most expensive James Bond movie to date costing a rumored 200 to 230 million dollars in 2008 dollars. Now No Time to Die is apparently very expensive too but with inflation considered Quantum of Solace is indeed the most expensive James Bond film ever made. And it's too bad because critical reaction to this film was not great. It earned an approval rating of about 65% on Rotten Tomatoes. And in fact, it was the first James Bond movie that I ever reviewed for Joe Blow, and I gave it a 7 on 10. Now, I know that sounds pretty good to you guys, but to me, as a James Bond fan that had a really hard time being impartial about the series, it was devastating. I remember going to see it and being sorely disappointed. And it was the first time that I realized, you know what, I was growing up as a critic because I could be fair to the film and not just be blinded by my absolute love of James Bond. A lot of fans were critical of the film, none more so than Roger Moore, of course, the great, great Roger Moore who played James Bond himself in seven movies, who said that Daniel Craig was a damn good Bond, but the film as a whole, well, there was just a bit too much flash cutting and it was less like a commercial of the action. There didn't seem to be any geography and you were wondering what the hell was going on. And I have to say that Roger Moore was dead on accurate in his rundown of the film. That's the problem with the movie. You just really don't know what's going going on at all. And the film was actually a financial hit, probably as big of a hit in some ways as Casino Royale. It broke box office records in the UK and did really well in North America. I think it was the biggest James Bond opening of all time with $67.5 million. It ended up grossing $589 million worldwide, which was pretty good. Quantum of Solace had the biggest opening weekend of all time for a James Bond movie and actually outgrossed Casino Royale by $1 million, although internationally it was 
was slightly less successful, and if you consider how much bigger the budget was, I would say that the profit margins for this film were minimal at best. It was a very expensive movie to make and to promote, and I think that people were kind of disappointed with it overall, including Eon Productions, who would take their time to craft a really solid third movie for Daniel Craig's James Bond. And of course, with Skyfall, they would get probably the biggest James Bond movie of all time, with box office records broken that are still standing to this day. It really would become a cultural phenomenon, and this movie was kind of seen by many as a misstep in the franchise. Watching Quantum of Solace again, I don't think it's quite as bad as some James Bond fans seem to think. It's definitely no Casino Royale, and it's not even nearly as good as Skyfall, which would be the next James Bond movie, but I do think in some ways it's better than Spectre, which would become the fourth James Bond film to star Daniel Craig. And I think that there's some really good things about it. Like I said, the cinematography is quite striking and there's some really dynamic sequences, but the action is just a mess and it's way too short. There's not enough story here, and I really wish they'd put off production of this movie until the Screenwriters Guild strike was solved. It would have made for a much better James Bond movie, and I think we'd all be much happier with the finished result. But as it is, Quantum of Solace is not a disastrous James Bond movie. It's just not a very good one and a disappointing second installment for Daniel Craig, and I give it a 6 on 10. But of course, things would start to look up on the next installment of James Bond Revisited. Bond, I need you back. I never left. like this video and you like the James Bond Revisited series, make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications every time we post a new video. We're an independent company and you know what? We appreciate all of your support.